Hi, I'm Rod Gilmore. I am chopping it up with Buck. We're chopping it up with Buck. We got my guy, Rod Gilmore. And it's tough to talk to you, man, in this setting because the pack is 8, 10, now 12 is no longer. I mean, it doesn't exist anymore. Rod, talk to us about it. Stanford grad. I'm a UCLA grad. It, it's tough when you have everything happening in college football and the lose yeah. regional situations. But what, what are your thoughts on that? Um. I have so many thoughts, you know, about it. I mean, you know, I start with being kind of ticked off, you know, irritated that uh, folks who were in charge squandered and wasted the history of a great conference, 108 years uh, of history. I mean, you know, I mean, just think about the, the great players and the great teams. You know, uh, there is the history of growing up uh, waiting for the Rose Bowl between the Pac-12, Pac-10, Pac-8, and the Big Ten. Um, all that meant to people, you know, you and I, you know, growing up playing in the conference, uh, vying to get to the Rose Bowl, um, having that that rivalry with the, with the Big Ten. Um, you know, the great players who have come through the conference that may not be thought about at all in the future, uh, forgotten about I, my own school, you know, Jim Plunkett, John Elway, you know, uh, Andrew Luck, uh, guys like Darren Nelson. You know, I, I, I remember, you know, uh, watching the great UCLA defenses of, of the past and, you know, wonder how we'd move the ball on them. Uh, you know, the USC days with Ronnie Lott and Dennis Smith in the back, uh, you know, playing against Charlie White and Marcus uh, Allen and all those guys, you know, the Huskies and their great teams, all that stuff, all that history, all that greatness wiped out, you know, <laughs> there, there's a great line, I'm an old English major, there, there, there's a great line from the novel The Sun Also Rises, you know, and there's a discussion about, well, how did you go bankrupt? Well, gradually and all at once. And there's your Pac-12. It happened gradually for, you know, a few years because of um, hubris and short-sightedness, uh, failure to uh, take advantage of the opportunity to do their own network the right way, um, failure to expand when they could have, um, failure to take advantage of the weakness of the Big 12 when Oklahoma and Texas uh, decided to leave and Big 12 teams were clamoring to get you know, to the um, the Pac-12, uh, failure to read the TV market and recognize a good deal when it was out there and walk away without any TV deal and opening the door for others to take advantage. It just folly, it just all fell apart when it didn't have to. So part of it makes me angry. Part of it makes me sad that we're losing a great conference. We'll see what happens next. Bring up a couple of good points. 2011 or 12 might have been a turning point when they didn't get the Pac-16 because there was some momentum in the conference. You know, there oh, were yeah. that were going in the right direction. Uh, it, it was a, it appeared on the surface Larry Scott was doing everything the right way, but it wasn't. We we kind of right. know there was a, a shell game, almost like right. you know when when you look back in history, you'll see why do you move to San Francisco? Why do you get this TV deal? That is not a deal. It was all paper money. It was, you know, it just didn't exist. And the, the thing that struck me was they were so close then to almost moving the Big 12 almost away from itself and not knowing what would happen then to that conference. And then the Big 12, like you said, that TV deal that they had last summer or the summer, I, I, at the time I might be off, but when they had the opportunity and then they go and listen to uh, an academic person tell them, Oh, uh, you can get fifty million. No, you can't. <laughs> Look, when when they do the autopsy on yeah. this, and w whether that is a thirty for thirty or whether it is, you know, a business school, uh, you know, look at, at what happened. The big point will be a year ago, 
the Pac-12 and the Big 12 were in the exact same spot. The Big 12 was losing their two bell cows in Oklahoma and Texas, new commissioner coming in. Pac-12 was losing USC and UCLA, had just brought in a new commissioner the year before, and they were both trying to figure out how to survive. And the Big 12 was aggressive, went out and got teams. They read the TV market correctly. They took a deal in a falling market, stabilized themselves, and the Pac-12 sat back and did nothing and let their deal expire and let and let members get antsy. And then you essentially had, I don't know, I, I won't I won't say anything about other schools in the conference because I, I don't know what was going on there. But I know that on the Stanford front for years, there have been a lot of us trying to convince Stanford to be more aggressive, to take action, to recognize that what was coming with name, image, and likeness, and what was coming with TV deals, these, these things were changing. And Stanford needed to move and take advantage and be in position. And the administration was not hearing it to UCLA a few years ago until Mark Jarman comes in and has some familiarity and then USC and UCLA kind of doing their deal and leaving. You're right. Yeah. You had to be aggressive and assertive. You couldn't yeah. kind of ease your way into this. But you bring up another good point. You and I always have this conversation at our meetings and everything else. This NIL deal, um, I know it's never going to go back to how it was. I don't, I don't anticipate that it should have been this way probably when you and I were playing, but it wasn't. Right. And right. I don't I don't begrudge those guys because I'm happy now they're able to make a, uh, a honest buck. If they don't get to the next level, hopefully they're doing the right things. And I'm hearing some really good things about we hear the horror stories, but I'm hearing some really good things like a young man who was sending money back to Hawaii to help the victims in Hawaii. Every year yeah. I hear multiple things like that. Hopefully they're yeah. stocking money away. What is it about NIL, though, that we can see morphing and changing over the next few years uh, to it's not going to change, but what, what do you see as you look in your crystal ball? Well, the first thing is that uh, the uproar over NIL is misplaced. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think if we've learned anything in the last few weeks, it's that the thing that has changed and really hurt college athletics more than anything is the ability of programs to transfer, you know, the, the ability of them to set the market for their form of name, image, and likeness with TV dollars and the like. That that has upset and changed the fabric of college athletics, not just for football and basketball, but for the non-revenue sports, yeah. you know, as well. Um, to me, name, image, and likeness should have been resolved a long time ago because athletes <laughs> were put into a second class of citizenry where they're the only people in America who could not take advantage of their name, image, and likeness. And that's becoming clear that the states and the courts will no longer tolerate that. You know, um, I, I think in the in the end, there will still be a push by the NCAA and others to try and regulate and come up with guardrails. But look, we really don't have those guardrails in our society in the free market. I mean, the only way to really get those types of guardrails is to allow players to create some sort of an organization. Some people call it a union, some say an association, whatever it is. But if you want to put some limits and caps, you know, I'm putting my lawyer, lawyer hat on now, you want to have some limits and caps on what a group, so-called a working group can do, well, then you let them organize in some way, shape, or form. Now, again, technically, whether that is a union or association is a debate for another day, but they should be able to bargain with uh you know, TV, the conferences and the like to figure out what makes sense. You know, if you want to have some caps as to, you know, whether you share revenue, how much of that goes to players, how that gets allocated, what the limits are, what the restrictions are, that's got to come in some sort of negotiated agreement between the parties. This notion that you're going to have one group impose caps and limits on another group sorry, this is America, man. We believe in capitalism. You know, uh, people complain about poaching. You know what happens every day of the week in this country? People steal employees from other companies all the time. Uh, unless you have an ironclad non-compete agreement and some states don't like those non-competes, 
unless you have that, people will tamper, will pursue. We have executive search firms that do that. It happens for coaches every day of the week. Why all of a sudden is a big special thing that players might be the apple of the eye of some other program. It's it's amazing. Like, when are we going to realize that, hey, they're, they're people too, they're humans too, they're Americans too, they have the same rights, should have the same rights as everyone else. Mike Cristobal says, if you're that concerned about name, image, and likeness, let them have some group, association, whatever, and try and collectively negotiate the caps and limits of guardrails that you want and, and see where that goes. Take you back to high school, even, you know, growing up in Oakland, uh, you know, it's interesting to uh, just kind of when, when when you talk to people and then you start doing some research, it's always interesting that, that your parents are both served, one in city council, one as a mayor. You know, Oakland is, is pretty near dear to me because being from Texas, a lot of my relatives moved out to the West Coast, some past yeah. in L.A., but a lot in Oakland. And Same. it's always a kindred yeah. spirit between kind of the Houston and, and Oast, Oakland flavor. <laughs> yeah, my, I've got family in Houston. Yeah, you know, my folks were part of the the big migration from Oklahoma to Texas to to California. Uh, so yeah, a lot of friends and family in Houston, and you know, we used to, you know, uh, every other year make uh, the pilgrimage, you know, back to to Houston and little towns like Crockett and you know, Grapevine, Grapevine, you know. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm more that yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, and Rob, what was it like growing up in Oakland? Uh, growing up in, in the Bay and just getting a chance to, and who were the coaches? I know your parents are influential to you, but who were the coaches that kind of were teachers or counselors that got you going in the right direction to go to Stanford, go to Cal to get your law degree to, you know, yeah. do all those things? You know, it's amazing. I look back on that time and, um, it was unbelievable the number of volunteers, uh, just the the unselfish uh, black men who were baseball coaches who would pick us up, drive around town, picking up all the players to get us to a field to practice uh, and the like. And you know, I grew up playing ball with uh, we had some pretty good baseball players in Oakland back back in the day. Um, Played a lot of baseball too growing up. Same, yeah. You know, I played on teams in the summer with uh, with Ricky Henderson, um, Gary Pettis, Lloyd Mosby. Uh, we played against each other in high school. We tried to play on the same teams in the summer. Uh, but we had an awful lot of guys who, you know, cared about making sure that we were all involved and not just hanging out, you know, on the street. Um, you know, and I had a great, great high school coach, Joe Pinella. Uh, had played, um, you know, Major League Baseball for a minute, a lot of time uh, in the minors, uh, and really, you know, was the guy that kind of, you know, focused my athletic career. Um, I was, you know, playing football, was pretty good at it, but the whole focus was sort of sort of baseball. And so I kind of always saw myself as a two-sport athlete, and the Stanford thing was really attractive because, you know, they wanted me to play both. And, you um, and that worked for me. And I just, you know, from the, the time that I was a kid, because, you know, my parents really pushed education and, you know, they were involved, as you said, with, you know, local politics and and with civil rights. And so it was one of these, hey, we actually marched for the right uh, for you guys to, to, you know, have access to great education. You will take it seriously. And you will vote when it's time to vote. And so all those things were important and precious. And, and we did it. So I, I saw myself as, as that kind of a person. And, you know, first I was interested in all the schools that were interested in me. But the moment that Stanford, you know, said, yeah, we're offering, you know, a full ride. And folks heard about it, like, oh, seriously, can, can you really choose any other place? I mean, it's, it's an hour away and it's one of the great universities you know, in the world. And yeah, my folks are sort of like, yes, you can decide to go wherever you want so long as it's Stanford. <laughs> I got, I, I was recruited by Stanford at the time when, you know, I think Jack Elway was there and I had, you know, I went on a visit there, went to UCLA. It, it, it is a really nice campus. And it, it was one of those situations where you were blown away because I hadn't 
really spent a lot of time in Palo Alto or in San Jose. If I was in yeah. the Bay, I was, you know, Oakland or Alameda or, or places like that. Yeah. And then yeah. you get on that place, man, and it's just, it is really a cool spot. I tell people all the time, you need to go visit. If you've never been to Stanford, just go spend some time. Yeah, there. it's it's amazing. But listen, Westwood is no slouch to either oh, because, yeah. um, <laughs> so Dick, Dick Tomei was the running backs coach at UCLA, and he was recruiting me there. Okay. And I was, and you remember Theotis Brown was from my high school and, and he was yeah. at UCLA. And so I was like, oh, it's, it's, it's UCLA. It's all about UCLA. And uh, then Dick Tomey left to become the head coach at Hawaii. Yeah. And he kept recruiting me. And one of his pitches to me was, you know, UCLA, yeah, they, they want you, but they don't, they don't want you. They don't want you like, the rest of us want you, you know, they, you're part of the skyline thing, the Otis, they want to keep the good relationship there and everything. And yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're, you're their, you're their guy. You're not their guy, guy, you know? And that was enough to make me go, uh, you still have done really want me as much as everybody else. And, you know, you Basketball, they were with us. Uh, Greg Foster was at UCLA. Right. He was guy that guy. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Foster and I had some great times before he transferred. We we had some fun. I can remember taking scooters from Westwood to the beach and hanging out and just doing crazy stuff. Well, well, Rod, I mean, when you got to Stanford and you started playing, what was it that, you know, when you got there, uh, were you able to right away get on the field or what, what, what was your, your journey at Stanford? Um, no, I redshirted my true freshman year, okay. um, and that was probably uh, the year I learned the most about football, like from zero to 100. Bill Walsh was our coach, um, Great. and so uh, I played corner on the scout team, and every day, every practice, you know, he'd tell me before practice, hey, um, this is what their best corner does. This is what they do defensively. I need you to be, sometimes it was super aggressive, you know, sometimes it was, hey, the guy is a quiet talker, you know, but he's technically sound. So I need you. And here's how we're manipulating. So I, I got to watch the West Coast offense up close and personal and to see why he was doing what he was doing and how a three-step and five-step was married to everything. Yeah, I've read his book, but what was it like being coach? I mean, they, you know, people talk about genius mind. And I, I don't think yeah. he liked that moniker, but he was a different thinker. The way he just, the way he knew how to tap in the players. Yeah. So his X and O game was next level. And even yeah. the coaches that have come under his tree will just talk about how he molded them and helped them understand the game of football, but also life. Bill was not a guy, you know, from the ivory tower. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bill, Bill was a guy who knew everything. And one of the things, you know, Bill, Bill was a boxer at one point, you know, and a good solid little street fighter when he had to be. And so he was big on, hey, leverage. Uh, if you punch first, make that a good punch, you know. Uh, and not being intimidated by by talk and how to respond. I mean, he he could he could really get into the nitty gritty of a game and what goes on and how you deal with things and whatnot. Um, but but learning from him how the West Coast offense operated and how they were manipulating the defense uh, that whole that whole year is kind of what I learned. And then my uh, sophomore year or my redshirt freshman year, I became a starter at corner and I had George Seifert as my position coach. And nobody knew more about defense and secondary play than George Seifert. And so it was, you're in the lab, you're in the clinic, everything from, you know, positioning, uh, foot, back pedal, uh, what you read, what you see, every single play from every coverage, you know, learned, learned all that from him. And, um, you know, after my sophomore year, Bill and, and George were gone to the 49ers. And, um, you know, so that, that changed things. But I felt like I had such a great foundation uh, that I was kind of on my way. 
um, had a, a season or two with tough injuries, but bounced back from those. And, you know, uh, my, my last college game was that awful 1982. You know, I, I mean, you know, everybody knows about the catch. Just yeah. but take me back there, though, just being on the field. When things like that happen, I don't think people realize Rod was involved in the 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 the, the, the catch, as it's known, or you know, whatever it was. Yeah, they call it the play, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the play. I mean, and it's Stanford and Cal. That's a major rivalry for people. And is on the field, yeah. <laughs> yeah, bands <laughs> on. The, I mean, it was nuts. But what yeah. was it like to be actually in the stadium and be on the field that day? Well, so first of all, it, it was a great game. Yeah, I mean, it, it was nip and tuck the whole way. Um, you know, sold out, just one of the great, crazy rivalries, you know, um, and our defense probably played, um, if not the, well, that wasn't the best game we played all year, but it was a pretty close one. We'd played Ohio State uh, back at in Columbus and beat them and held them to 13 points or something like that. So, you know, we'd had the ability to come up and have some really big games. Um, and we kept them pretty much intact, uh, intact most of the game. They got a couple of phantom touchdown catches where the official missed the ball, hit in the ground. But that's a story. Yeah, my, my yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. But the crazy thing was, you know, we uh, we get uh, we're, we're down, you know, less than a minute, two minutes ago, whatever it is. They're trying to run out the clock. We get a stop. We get the ball back. And we had no doubt we we're going to win. Because John Elway is John Elway, right? So uh, funny thing, though, is it often starts going backwards. And we're like fourth and 15 on our own, inside our own 10-yard line. And still, we're like, nah, John's going to pull one out. And um, he threw this ball to Emil Harry, great receiver, spent, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 years in the NFL. Um and there were three guys around him. And Emil told me later, he said, John told him in the hallway, in the in the huddle, get open. <laughs> Just get open. And so he runs this curl at, you know, 20 yards deeper or so. And John put a bullet. And Emil said he had no chance. He couldn't possibly have dropped it. It would have knocked him over. And there were three Cal defenders around him. And they couldn't get a hand up to do anything. First down, drive continues. We move on down. We get what we call the game-winning field goal with eight seconds to go. They called a timeout before kicking it, left four seconds. And, like, now the celebration's on, you know. And for me, I was normally the safety on the kickoff coverage team. We usually had our corners do that. Uh, but uh, both starting corners, we'd been banged up the last couple of weeks. And so it was, hey, we'll put the young guys out there. You guys just play defense, you know. So I wasn't – that day I wasn't out there, right? And so you look up and, you know, everybody's playing hard, doing the best they can, and they think the game's over. But, you know, as a safety, you don't get involved in that stuff, right? You just – you hang back and you wait and you make sure you're looking for all the debris and you're waiting for stuff. But our guys – you know, they want to go be part of the celebration and whatnot, and the ball comes out, and there you go. Short break. We'll be right back. We're chopping it up with Buck with Rod Gilmore. At Heslip Wealth Advisors, our goal is to help small businesses develop quality retirement plans for their employees through our Lunch and Learn seminars. We provide lunch and learning tools to help your company succeed and unmatched customer service. Join us each week and a new celebrity guest on Chopping It Up with Buck. Brought to you by Thin Energy. ThinEnergy.com. Now we're back with uh, Chopping It Up with Buck. And earlier we talked a little bit about the Pac-12 when I heard Rod's perspective. And Rod, it, 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 it was hard for me um, just as a player in that conference and watching yeah. the historical aspects of it because – Growing up in Texas, I love the state of Texas, but football players weren't allowed, if they were black players, to really play until the 70s in some place, right. places in the Southwest Conference. So when you see a Warren Moon that's going to play quarterback in Washington or even before it was a pack, whatever, 
you know, uh, Jackie Robinson and Kenny Washington and all those guys. That, to me, you know, it, it just made it, the historical aspect of West Coast football was the thing that I, I, I thought. Because I grew up like you. I grew up watching all of the teams in my area. But when yeah. the Rose Bowl was on, I watched it. And I can remember the games and, you know, the guys. I can remember Anthony Carter from, you know, Michigan. Mm-hmm. I can remember the guys from, you know, uh, UCLA or USC or whoever was in the Rose Bowl. And it just it, it stuck on me going out there in the seventh grade to play in an AAU basketball tournament. And I told my mom and everybody else, I said, hey, recruit me. I'll, I'll go back there because I was on campus. We were there for a week. And it was great. It was basketball. We had fun. But I always remember that. And it's it's hard to see that now leave with the, the rivalries yeah. between Arizona and Arizona State and us and you know yeah. even Utah who has come in and probably yeah. been in the Pac twelve soon or Pac ten but when they got a chance they came in and they've been able to do yeah. a really nice job you know going up to the my first time going up to Washington the sail gate you know and the yeah. Huskies when you walk down that tunnel there behind you the place is rocking it, it, it it's tough for me to think back to going to Oxford Stadium and quieting their crowd, making yeah. big plays, you know, yeah. coming up to Stanford or Cal. It, 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 it's hard. It's a hard one People, for me. Yeah, folks don't realize the rivalries that are going to be lost. I mean, you know, the whole NorCal, Southern Cal thing between Stanford, USC, Stanford, UCLA, Cal, USC, you know, um, yeah. Cal, UCLA. I mean, Cal... Cal has an annual Joe Roth game against USC. And Joe Roth was a great, great quarterback at Cal who died of cancer okay. and in 1976, I want to say, or so, 77. And they have this game every every other year against USC at Berkeley in his honor. And I'm thinking, that that's gone now. You know, it's it's amazing the rivalries that that are going away because of this. So, you, you know, you you were diagnosed years back. You've been battling it. It sounds like things are good. But tell us a little bit about that. I know uh, it's never easy when you deal with that. But you mm-hmm. dealt with it in a way that with a lot of class, a lot of character. Uh, some folks didn't even know. But we, we all kind of knew because we knew you from the inside. Tell us about that. And Dave Fleming's a little man. Every time I see that, that just, yeah, it, it breaks me down. It makes my eyeballs want to sweat a little bit. Yeah, Flem, Flem's amazing, and that was an amazing piece he wrote. So, um, so like I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma in 2016. It's a blood cancer. I knew nothing about it. It came about because I have an, I had an annual physical, and that was one of the things that my wife made me promise when we got married, so I'd get an annual physical. And I'm so glad that that I did. Uh, because without an annual physical, this would not have been discovered as early as it was. It would have been picked up much later, probably too late. And I try and you know make it a point to uh, to talk to people. And it's part of the reason I wasn't private about it. I tried to be open and public about it is because having an annual physical gives you a chance to fight these things if you have them discovered. If you don't go in, you don't have physicals, you really don't give yourself a chance at all. So I had no idea what multiple myeloma was. Um, I didn't know that it was a blood cancer that, you know, starts in your bone marrow. Um, I didn't know that it affects black people twice as often as others. And it was unknown in our community. Um, So um, there currently is not a cure for it. Uh, there have been great improvements in the last, you know, 10, 12 years with treatments. Uh, and everyone's excited about some of the non-chemo treatments uh, that are coming online, uh, immunotherapy, and where that's leading. And everyone's optimistic that there will be a cure in the not too distant future. Um, but, you know, you, um, you, you, you hear the words cancer, you know, and... For me, anyway, I just I sort of went, you know, blank because at first my doctor said multiple myeloma. I had no idea what he was talking about. And I I said, okay, so how do we treat this? And he said, I can't help you. This is cancer. I'm like, whoa, wait, what? 
what do you mean cancer? And so, you know, immediately you start thinking about, you know, what's the impact on your, your family, your kids, your wife, you know, your friends, uh, can you work, whatever. Um, and for me, I just decided pretty quickly that this had to be more about something bigger than me. It couldn't be about me and woe is me and what's tomorrow and whatnot. That that just wasn't wasn't going to be good enough. Um, and so it was more important for me to help spread the word uh, that this is out there, that if I didn't know about it and I was afflicted with it, there had to be other people and that getting an annual physical makes a big, big difference. And also that, you know, um, finding out that the treatments for so long had been the same treatments as there had been for 30, 40 years ago. That's just not right, you know? So that that's the whole thing. For me, it was, look, um, as Jim Valvano said, might not get taken care of in my lifetime, but we can get cancer on the run and we can, we can beat it. So that's kind of the story in a nutshell. Um, I try to not worry about beating cancer, I worry about living with cancer and making sure that I live my life the way I want to and try not to make any concessions and rock and roll. So make, meaning making no concessions. What about this football season? Uh, where are you at early on in the year? And I know uh, it's going to be interesting because the Pac-12 is actually going to be pretty good on the field. Yeah, I, yeah. I know you come uh, out a lot. Isn't it ironic that yeah. this may be the most exciting year of football in the Pac-12, and it might be the last year of the Pac-12? That's crazy. The no, quarterback no. play should be so much more elevated. Yeah. It, it is ridiculous. Everybody I've talked to in different places has just said, yeah. Penix, man, he's looking awesome. You know, the, the kid up at the, – the, the battle up at uh, Oregon State. Oregon State quietly could probably be the best team in the conference and could win it with the way they play ball. And Jonathan Smith, man, they punch you in the mouth, man. You know, <laughs> if, if 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 I had enough strength, I would pick Oregon State to win the conference. Oh, I, that, I'm with that, you. <laughs> that's, that's how much I like that team. And DJ Ulyan Galele is now the starting quarterback there. I think it's a perfect environment for him. It is. Now, Jonathan Smith knows how to handle quarterbacks. He knows how to play to their strength. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a tough football team. I like teams that are a little different than everybody else. Uh, everybody's you know spread you know yeah. RPO. He's a little bit more. Give me two backs. Give me some play action. We're gonna come at you. You know yeah. we're gonna control the game. We're not trying to run ninety plays. Yeah. Be happy with sixty or so. So I, I I like that approach and I like that they're different. Um, you know, I, I if I if I had the guts, I would pick Oregon State to win the conference. I really would. Good too. I mean, I know Cam Rising. We don't know what's going to happen there, but they're talking about that's the issue. Their offensive line is supposed to be the best yeah. one they've had, but if, well, if, he's not, if he's not healthy, though, you're right because you know that defense. Yeah, that Utah defense has grown up. They they were young the last couple of years, and you could you could hit them a little bit now and then, get them to bust some things. But I, I think that defense is has much more depth, much more grown up, much more experienced. Uh, everybody's dissing Utah, you know, not giving them a shot. And if Cam Rising gets healthy, I just worry because, you know, an ACL to get through that in eight months and be ready to rock and roll, that that's a lot. I, I, I figure physically a year the mental, in. The mental part, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. USC, as everybody talks about them being the class, I really think UCLA is going to make some noise. I don't know how good they're going to be, but I'm hearing that defensively, this is probably the best they've looked. And I know my former teammate, Ken Norton, is there. He makes a difference on whatever defense he's with. But USC, going to them, think about Caleb Williams. I know as good yeah. as they are on offense, I don't trust their defense. And I know they're supposed to be better this year. I think, um, yeah, I spent a little time looking at USC this offseason defensively. Okay. And um, I think there are a couple things with them. Uh, one, they haven't had the front that you would find at SEC places, you know, Georgia, 
you know, Alabama. Back in the day, you know what I mean? Right, right. They they don't have a front like that. Now, maybe they're a little better with that now. And so I didn't I didn't understand philosophically their approach. You know, so they had a lot on first down. Their approach was, hey, you know, we're we're just going to muscle up with you and we'll play. And my view is that when you aren't all that in your front seven, you've got to mix it up and be a little bit more aggressive on first down. And USC was terrible in first down defense last year. Just awful. They gave up too much yardage. And they were not a blitz team, not a pressure team on first down. And I think philosophically that doesn't work when you aren't dominant in a front seven, you know? So I, I, I think, I think something's got to change. Either they got to have the guys that will allow them, you know, to play it safe on first down, or they got to be more aggressive on first down, create some second and long and give themselves a chance because they are not going to be plus 22 on takeaways this season. That's an aberration. You bring up another good point about being tough up front. I tell people all the time, when you have good Polynesian, Samoan, uh, Tongan kids that play for your front, and a lot of those kids don't just stay on the West Coast like they used to. They can go anywhere now. They'll play at LSU. They'll play, you know, and, and teams understand that. But historically, those teams at USC, when they've been good, have had big physical fronts. Um, Utah does it now. They have a yeah. pipeline from, yeah. from the uh, with the Polynesian kids. That to me is where USC and UCLA have not been the same. And I know USC is UCLA is starting to do it more. Can the Amatololo? That was a great yeah. move by Chip. Yeah. What do you see with because those kids, man, when they start going, they will stay at those schools, and it just it becomes. Uh, Arno Ale was was there. Junior Seau, who I played against. I mean, I can, yeah. you know, all the guys that have come through that area, whether it's Northern Cal or Southern Cal, yeah, and and, and they're your brothers for life. When you go to battle with with them cats, yeah. they remind me of dudes from home. And I tell yeah. people that, that that don't that don't really spend much time on the West Coast. And now that they see kids that are getting other places, they understand that. And I think that's one of the things that has been missing with some of these schools on the West Coast when they've lost. The connection like a Dick Tomey had at Hawaii, uh, exactly, and Akina yeah. at Stanford, all those years. Yep. I, I know, you know, I know the guys that were recruiting them. Guy That's right. Day who is, uh, um, was that just retired from Utah? Those yep. names of recruiters that knew how to go in those Hawaiian, Polynesian, Samoan homes and recruit kids, it doesn't happen the same to me sometimes now on the West Coast. You're, you're absolutely right, and I think that link, um, has been missing. I'm, I'm curious to see how that gets replaced. And I'm curious to see about the impact on NIL, you know, that folks may come to realize that that money is better spent, you know, getting in some of the big guys up front uh, and creating that pipeline. Um, And some of that, I talked to some players last season about what they did with the NIL money and the like, and a lot of guys, whether, you know, they were Polynesian or whether they came from, um, tougher backgrounds. A lot of guys told me, well, this is great because I'm helping mom take care of some bills at home. And I think, I think a lot of people, I think the public overlooks that, doesn't, doesn't get that a lot of these guys are helping their families, you know, with their extra money, pay the electric bill, do a grocery shopping, you know, pay some rent, you know, and I just, it's, we we gotta be we gotta be better. We gotta be better. There there is so much more that should be available, you know, to players. All right, Rod. So two minute drill. We just rapid fire. First thing okay. comes to mind. Quick question. Right. We'll talk through it. Uh, you saw the hat earlier. Bourbon or vodka? Bourbon. Ah, and you like Uncle Nearest like I do. Uh, uh, big fan. Yeah. Great story, isn't it? It's just a great story about. Yeah. So many things that we know in our community that happen that don't get the publicity. That's one that I love. What about you? Uh, I love that. And I love the fact that, you know, I'm supporting something that really tastes good, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no it's good, yeah. <laughs> well, I got to ask you, the best burger place in your area, where do you go if you want a good burger and you just say, I got I to gotta have one today? If you, And it could well, be a turkey burger. It could be. A, a, a veggie burger. I know, you know, diets have changed, but any yeah. 
I yeah, mean, I, I'm, I'm I'm not a burger guy. I haven't had red meat in 20 plus years or yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, but I, I I will say this: um, when it when it comes to French fries, I am a Five Guys diehard fan. Ooh. I I, I, with, I with think the they Cajun? win hands down with the Cajun. Cajun doesn't season? matter. Doesn't okay. matter. Okay. It, it can it can be straight up with no salt, or it can be Cajun. I'm good either way. They just they have the right amount of potato to crispness. Yeah, with them. So the only, the only other place that I, I, I mean, and it's it's not a it's when you go to the Bay Area, you go to San Francisco, and they have the garlic fries at at their, yeah. at their stadium at the base at Pac Bell, or I can't remember. I, yeah, name. yeah, not really a fan. <laughs> no, garlic fries work, and and that's a good place. You know, and there are a couple small places out here uh, that we go to, hole in the wall, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that are just great with. You know things like that with 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 French fries and and pizza. There's a place in in our old town Alameda. Yeah, it's a place called East End, and for for oysters and French fries and and handmade thin pizzas, it is top of the and, notch. And be, well, you, you talk about good food. What about music? What what what's in the iPad or the I, Apple Music or Spotify? What what what's what I am you? I am very very eclectic man because. I get it from my my adult kids uh, and my wife. And so my wife leans a little bit more to anything from the 70s, 80s, you know, onward. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm I a big fan of Kendrick Lamar. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I get a lot of a lot of that. And then, you know, my my kids make sure that I get all the uh, uh, weekend and Post Malone. <laughs> Uh, and everything else, but um, but yeah, if if you if you force me to say what what what's bumping like you know fifteen minutes before airtime, it's probably mm -hmm. a little Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Well, I'll tell you if you if you know Chris Stapleton, who if you like country music, is a great singer. But he had oh, yeah. a group, a War and Treaty uh, couple. Uh, they are outstanding if, if you yeah. hear the music and and it's interesting I can go to different genres and it just but lately I've been been bumping their new album or the Black Pumas have been another one that's been late so my my daughter has been regularly sending me uh country playlists for the last year or so yeah. saying you you got to be more eclectic you know and I'm like all right I'm working with this <laughs> I hear you I hear you well you, you know when you when you think about um, just all of the music that's out there, it's easy for them to kind of send that to you and, you know, yeah. all of a sudden you look up, yeah, you got it. If, if you could go to dinner with one person, uh, who would that be? Uh, and sometimes uh, I tell you, if you can't take one, give me a couple, because I it just, who would you like to have break bread with? Well, um, I, I I probably an easy one that most folks would say. Well, yeah, duh. Um, Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, Barack Obama sitting in the White House um, was really something impactful in my family, um, given that my my folks were heavily involved in the civil rights movement and probably never expected to see an African American as a president. And I, I got to believe that the stories that he could share privately uh, would be unbelievable. And just to, um, you know, have dinner with him and talk about his experiences in the White House, not, not what it meant to him, but he clearly understands what it meant to uh, a community, a nation, the world. And I just like to, you know, have a couple hours to talk uh, through all that magnitude of it. Well, you scored on that, man. Stanford wins this time. That we, 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 you know, Cal last time, Stanford this time. Thanks, man. <laughs> man, it's good. We've been talking about this for a while. I'm glad to finally get you on and uh, we'll have to do it yeah. again. You know, just it's so much you can go into and, and, and I, I appreciate your time, the technical difficulties, but we, we, we were determined to stay after it. I always we always fight through that stuff. No worries. Yeah, we'll we'll connect uh, during the season. Just you know, when it works for you, let me know. We'll get on. And uh, the the one thing I'll leave you with is that I I, I I'm frustrated that uh, college football and actually pro football, but mostly college football, has been controlled by the offenses. You know, for so long, it's time for the defensive guys to. 
pick up the mantle and fight back. Because right now, your guys have been whipping us year in and year out for a long time. I'm ready for some new creativity and something to make the offenses pause a little bit because we haven't had it for a while. I got you. Well, thanks a lot, Rob. Appreciate you coming on. All right, bro. Appreciate you, man.